All right, I think uh, we can go ahead and get started. It's a real pleasure to be here to welcome an old friend to Princeton. Uh, so on behalf of both the Trans Regional Institute and the Brown Bag Lunch, um, I have the, the special privilege today to introduce my old friend, Ahmad Al-Jalad. Uh, Professor Jalad is, of course, the Sophia Chair of Arabic Studies at Ohio State University, uh, a chair which he has only recently uh, taken up. Uh, before moving to Columbus, uh, he was, for six years, assistant professor of ancient Arabia and Arabic and Semitic linguistics at Leiden University. Now, as we were putting together our list of brown bag speakers uh, for this year, uh, Ahmed was suggested uh, by four discrete individuals. This is more, I think, than any other uh, speaker has ever been suggested, at least in my experience with the brown bag. Uh, so I was especially happy to see this because Ahmed was, of course, an old friend uh, from graduate school. Now, anyone with a serious interest in early Islam or in early Arabic has no doubt come across Professor Jalad's name, either through his numerous publications or through his prolific public-facing scholarship. Many of you might know him from an article which appeared last year in The New Yorker, uh, an article entitled A New History of Arabia Written in Stone, written by our colleague Elias Mohanna. Ahmed is a leading specialist in the early history of Arabic and North Arabian. He's told me to keep my introduction short, so I won't read everything that he's, he's published. But uh, suffice it to say that he stands at the cutting edge of a field which is revolutionizing our understanding of uh, pre-Islamic Arabia. Um, without uh, listing you know, uh, his, his publications, which are too numerous to mention here, I simply recommend that everyone visit his, uh, his uh, academia.edu page, uh, in which you can find not just uh, his, his publications, but also numerous works in progress and teaching documents. I mean, it's a real treasure trove uh, for anyone who was involved in teaching uh, late antique history. In addition to this, Ahmed is a, uh, currently directing a, a field survey, epigraphic surveys, uh, both in the basalt desert of Jordan and uh, a new project also coming in Oman. And as if this weren't enough, uh, his, uh, his work in progress, the, the word, the blade, and the pen, 3,000 years of Arabic, is under contract with Princeton University Press. Today's lecture is entitled Death and Remembrance in Pre-Islamic Arabia, and as you join me in welcoming Professor Ahmed al jalad to, to today's talk, please also silence your devices. Mm -hmm. And now, thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. And I thank the organizers for hospitality and uh, inviting me here. It's a real pleasure and honor to speak to a room of uh, learned colleagues. Uh, well, I'm speaking today about death and remembrance in pre-Islamic Arabia. Very, very broad topics, but perhaps the broadest uh, uh, a phrase here is pre-Islamic Arabia, uh, which can span, of course, uh, several thousand years into the past and a continent. So I would like to explain a little bit about where this picture comes from and what part of pre-Islamic Arabia we'll be focusing on during today's lecture. This picture comes from the uh, Badia surveys of northeastern Jordan. Uh, this is the Harra. It's a basalt desert, as you can see, uh, mostly black stone and um, uh, a lot of uh, wadis and areas for pasturage in northeastern Jordan on the Syrian border. And we have been surveying there for the last, uh, uh, we'll say about five years almost, documenting the archaeological sites and epigraphy of this region. And the Harra, uh, which you can see here, um, stretches from the, uh, uh, the, the Safa area of southern Syria all the way down to northern Saudi Arabia, and it's an absolutely magnificent landscape. And perhaps one of the, uh, the nicest ways that it's been described is the world's largest open-air archive. Mm -hmm. The Harra is home to, well, so far, some 50,000 Safiitic inscriptions have been documented here, and that is the tip of the iceberg, in addition to Greek, Aramaic, Nabataean, and Arabic inscriptions, Arabic script inscriptions from the uh, early Islamic period until our day uh, today. The period that I'm interested in is, of course, the Safiitic inscriptions, the inscriptions that uh, were produced perhaps around the turn of the era, and we'll talk about them a bit. Uh, and last season, when we were driving through these wadis, we came across a very interesting uh, structure. This is a a cairn, perhaps a memorial cairn, we can't know for sure. Uh, there are lots of archaeological sites out here that require serious excavation, but we are just doing surveys. We're documenting the archaeological sites and we're recording inscriptions. But this particular cairn uh, had in front of it a stone, 
uh, a very interesting inscription. The script on it is, in the, is Safiitic, the particular hand of the Safiitic script. We can't date it exactly, but we estimate around 2,000 years old. And I'll read to you this inscription. The first part is the name and a small narrative about, uh, uh, about the individual named. And then the second component is actually the, perhaps the author's voice. First part reads, Li Hamid wa Tagha, for Hamid and he fell in war. And then Hamid tells us something. Wa qala, idhab, fala And he says, go and forget me. It's a memorial inscription, but at the same time he's telling the passerby not to stop and weep over his memory, but to rather move on with his life. And that is particularly interesting. I've never seen an inscription like this among the thousands of Safiatic inscriptions documented. Before we move on to the kind of, you can see that this is not the only inscription at the Cairn. You can see that there are some, let's see if I push this button here. Yes. Is, can you see a red light? No. It, it, okay, it's not. Okay, well then, you can see the stone uh, to the left of the cairn. There are some inscriptions on it. Uh, so these cairns, these structures have associated inscriptions, but I have never seen anything like this. Before we move into the types of inscriptions associated with cairns, associated with memorial uh, installations such as this, let's talk a little bit about the language and the script here, Safiyetic. Safiyetic is an ancient North Arabian alphabet. This is part of a script family that was used from Syria to the Yemeni frontier in pre-Islamic Arabia. We don't know when the inscriptions begin and we don't know when they end. But at least when it comes to Safiyetic, and that is the script that's used in this area, we can say that their authors were especially prolific around the turn of the era, around 2000 years ago. We don't know when the writing tradition began or when it ended though. Unlike the Arabic script, the early Arabic script, the North Arabian scripts are suited perfectly for the phonology of Arabic. They have an individual glyph for every Arabic consonantal phoneme. So there isn't the kind of ambiguities that you find in the later Arabic script, uh, although they don't write vowels at all. Uh, the language, as you will see, and as I read these inscriptions to you, and as you have just heard, is a variety very close to classical Arabic. It is almost, it's, it's in most cases mutually intelligible with classical Arabic. It belongs to a dialect continuum that I call Old Arabic, okay? Pre-Islamic Arabic as attested in these kinds of sources. Uh, and as I said, 50,000 recorded texts so far, and that is the tip of the iceberg. We cannot know exactly how many inscriptions are out there, but uh, they are, every time we, we, we'll survey for two weeks, and very often in two weeks, you can come back with 10,000 new texts, right? So it's an incredible uh, number of inscriptions. So the uh, archeology span of the Harra, the archeology span of this area is still in its infancy. There aren't very many sites that have been properly documented, even fewer that have been properly excavated. One of the challenges for studying archeological sites in this area is that the Harra has been continuously inhabited and most sites have been reused. So you may visit a cairn that would have Safiitic inscriptions and it also, it has been reused, uh, uh, additions have been made up into the modern period. You have modern Arabic inscriptions as, as there as well. And it's very difficult to determine how old the particular structure is in front of you or even who built that structure, right? So that is still, that whole process in its, is, is in its infancy. But there were a few memorial cairns that seem to be intact from, let's say, the Safiitic period. It's a, it's a bad conventional term, but we'll use it in that sense. Uh, memorial cairns, one famous one is the cairn of Hani. And why do we know it's the cairn of a man named Hani? Because this burial installation, you can see the, the structure and there's a grave underneath it, has 97 inscriptions of individuals who've come to mourn Hani. So they've come to this cairn, this burial, and they've mourned for him and they've recorded their grief on rock and added these inscriptions to the cairn. So the cairn is a memorial for the dead, but also a memorial for the grief of the living and the living's network, right? So 97 individuals. And some of the inscriptions are as you see here. So uh, you have a name, this man's name, Li Khatham bin Aqrab bin Hani, so perhaps his grandson. Wa baniya wa wagama ala Hani. Oh, ala akhi, actually his brother tells us. So he grieved for Hanit, his brother. Another man at the bottom, uh, Li Nasir bin Fas bin Hanit bin Hayr wa wagama ala Hanit wa banaya. 
he built, which means adding stones to the cairn. So you, what does wagama mean? Wagama means to grieve. It's the kind of grief. Wajam, you can find it uh, in classical Arabic uh, dictionaries also with a similar meaning, yes. So there's been a few uh, uh, cairns uh, and graves that have been excavated, that have been intact and excavated in the Harra, um, Kennedy's 2002 article, which you can find on academia.edu, uh, uh, summarizes these. And you can see in each case you have an individual or a few individuals, a structure, a funerary structure, installation, <laughs> and a number of inscriptions associated with that structure. These are individuals grieving for the deceased and adding inscriptions on stone to the installation. But it's not, only, it's not only funerary installations that can be used as uh, memorials, that can be used as ways or as points of remembrance for the dead, for the lost. What we have here is a campsite. The stones have been cleared out in ancient times and Maybe it was even used to our day. We know that it was used up into the Mamluk period, and I'll explain why in a moment. But you have a cleared out area where presumably your tents were placed, and you can see the wadi in the background where you would have camped and had your animals uh, pasture. And next to it, there are some animal pens. This rock here, this rock here, it's hard to see from here, contains three inscriptions. Here it is up close. So we have one main inscription and then a smaller one here. The main inscription is by a man named Gar Garm El, Li Garm El bin Dheb bin Kaun Hatsamd. So by Garm El, at this high place, Tsamd. There's not much information in this inscription, it's a signature. But over time, every signature like this becomes a memorial. At some later point, a man named Khutaisat bin Sakran bin Khutaisat, and that second Khutaisat there uh, you can take out because it's a, 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 a typo. وَوَجَدَ أَثْرَ غَرْمَيْلْ فَقَالَ خَبَالْ وَاتَّخَيَ عَلَيْهِ خَنَاي He found the trace, the athar of Garmel. That is, this man came and read that inscription, and he grieved. He he said, whoa, and some evil had befallen him. So presumably something terrible happened to Garmel. He died of some kind of, in, in some kind of unfortunate way. And there's a very small inscription here too um, by perhaps this man's brother. It says, Li Masik bin Khutaisat bin Sakran. And it just after that says, Wa wagada Garmel. And he found Garmel. So in a, and in a sense, just a signature, just a name, has a memorial function over time. These signatures that just mark being at a place in a certain time allow relatives, allow people who were connected to these individuals to remember them and to connect to them and to memorialize their memory and grief for them, the same as, formal, as, as uh, funerary installations. So the vast majority of texts in the Harra are names. Their personal names. But these aren't simply graffiti. They are all, depending on the audience, memorial. And we can see that any particular name, any kind of written, any signature acts as a memorial if it is encountered by someone <coughs> who knows that individual, who reads it, and responds to it. So every, every single signature can be treated as a memorial text, as a funerary text over in time. Uh, here are a few more examples. Uh, we have a man, Li Asad bin Hulm bin Rab'el bin An'am, gives his lineage. وَوَجَدَ أَثْرَ عَبْدْ فَنَوْجَعَ فَهَلَّتْ خِلَافْ لِذِي ضَلَلَ وَنَقَاءَتْ لِذِي يُعَوِّرْ هَالسِفْرَ So this individual Abd has perished. This Asad found his inscription and he grieves for him. نَوْجَعَ it's the infa'ala form of waja'a, right, to feel pain. And then he asks the goddess Allat for compensation to replace those who were lost. Hmm? And the most important part of these inscriptions because, and, 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 and it shows in fact that these texts were meant to be read, the curse that comes to protect them. Naqa'at, ejection from the grave to whoever scratches out this text. 
because by scratching out the text, you erase the memory of that individual. You erase the ability of the community to interact with uh, that particular individual in this way. This is the brother of the deceased, Li Rab El bin Abd, or sorry, the son, Li Rab El bin Abd, wa wagada asra abi. He found the trace of his father. Fabakaya, wa dakara li akhi, awal, fanauga'a, famahana'a. Even though there's nothing particularly funerary about this context from our point of view, it's just a signature, individuals turn it into a memorial site by pausing, stopping, reading these texts, and adding a, 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 a monument, in, in a way, of their own grief. Of course, those of you who know later Arabic poetry are seeing basically the poet prototype for the beginning of the Qasida, right? <coughs> Uh, and one more example. Gudaylat bin Hagnat the al Ziyad, Zakara Kharad Fadama'a. Now, the translation of a maiden is from Oceana. I'm not sure, maybe it's just a personal name. But you have again, remembering of a beloved person, Wadama'a or Damma'a, and he shed tears. So we have memorials certain individuals who are memorialized by, the, by building a funerary cairn, a large structure, and individuals can gather around the structure and mourn for them, or simply that same process happening with a signature, just a signature on stone. Now, this last summer, we pressed on into the Harra deeper than where uh, most previous expeditions had gone. We went, to, uh, we, went, we went to an area where you could not take your cars. You actually had to hike about five, six kilometers into the basalt to get there. Now, five, six kilometers is completely fine in a normal context. But if you look at this landscape in 115 degree heat, <laughs> carrying all your water on your back, it's, well, it's not, very <laughs> it's not a very happy experience. But we knew that we were in unexplored territory because there was no cigarette packaging to be found. <laughs> Right? No one had really been here. In fact, there isn't any evidence for modern Bedouin coming out this far. There are no modern Bedouin inscriptions. There's no plastic. There's no garbage. This area was pretty much untouched, and that's important because most places we find Safiatic inscriptions clustered are places anyone wants to spend time. And when people spend time there, they build and they rebuild. So most of our Safiatic inscriptions are out of context. Whatever structure they belonged to originally had been dismantled and rebuilt. But not here. We came up this to a really high place in, uh, in this valley. And you can see that this is not a particularly nice place to pasture. You're high, but there is no quick way down if there's any trouble with your animals. So you wouldn't really spend time here. We came up here and we saw this very interesting cleared out pit, stone circle. Step back, in fact it belongs to a larger installation, three cleared out areas. This is east-west. All the way at the eastern end, you have a cleared out, you have a, 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 a pit, stone circle, and two cleared out areas beside it. And in the last circle, you can see what we have here. It's a perimeter of inscriptions, completely surrounded by inscriptions, by texts. Never seen anything like this. Nothing has been documented like this before. You can see as you get close, the stones are covered with writing. And they form a perimeter in the western uh, cleared out area. Now, you can see unfortunately this one stone here was moved because the field hand saw it. He's like, oh, inscriptions, let's move them and photograph them. Stop, <laughs> you're ruining the context. This is a, a really special place. So that was the only one that was disturbed and we can know where it was sitting originally. Um, this area is, uh, the, 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 the inscriptions um, were especially exciting to read on the field. Limar bin Ghayyar el bin Sa'ad wa baniya wa wagama ala gub. Their funerary. He built and grieved for gub. Okay? And more and more say the same thing. Li aus bin Sahran bin Ghayyar el wa wagama ala gub wa baniya hathiyata the al-qamar. 
In fact, all the inscriptions were memorial inscriptions, funerary inscriptions connected to this one person, Gub. They built the Thiyat. That tells us what that is, right? What, whatever we're looking at here, this structure, it's not a cairn. It's what they called a Thiyat. And we'll talk about the etymology of that in a minute. Um, we get to know a little bit more about Gub here. Li Ghauth bin Sahran bin Ghauth El bin Sahran wa wagama ala Gub Arus wa matruhat da'at al Qamar bint Sawad wa baniya hathiyata fadishar awwar dha awwara ha khututa. It's a woman. She's Arus. Now, I don't want to translate Arus as bride. I have no idea what this word means in Safiyyadik, but it's cognate with Arabic, obviously, bride. Matruhat, she's perished. She's the daughter of Sawad. She's from the lineage of Qamar. This is a funerary installation of a woman. And here's her father. Li Sawad bin Sa'ad bin Taym bin Zahik wa li binti And this thiyat is for his daughter. Wa raghamah manai. And fate struck her down. We're going to come back to that in a moment. This thiyat is a new type of funerary uh, installation that we've never seen before. And in fact, it's probably a noun that comes from the root um, thawaya, to rest, to, a lot, to, to, um, uh, to dismount, to settle down. So thiyat is, is, is simply a noun meaning resting place, right? You have cleared out areas. We can't know exactly why these areas are cleared out. Were they areas of mourning? Did people sit in them and mourn for her? We can't know. We can speculate. That seems possible. Or maybe they had some other sig significance. Uh, there's a burial pit there. But what's interesting is it doesn't look like there's a grave. In fact, there's just mud and stones sunk into the mud. So they may have simply put her body there and piled stones on it. And as she decomposed and the elements uh, 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 took her away, the stones just sank into the ground, right? There's no burial as such. Um, and much like, but, but just like the Cairns, writing played an essential role in, an essential ritualized role in grieving and memorializing the dead. This was, writing here was monumental in the sense, but also personal, right? 54 inscriptions associated with Gob here. So 54 individuals came to mourn for her. Most of them from the lineage of Qamar, one of the tribes in the areas, right? Uh, she must have been of great importance. Uh, her father may have been someone very important. She may have been someone very important. It's impossible to say. Writing, writing was an, and writing was an essential part of memorializing individuals in the Harra, in the Safiyyadic context. Writing was a way of... Uh, uh, connecting generations, as we've seen, to the memory of those who have passed away and allowed later generations to interact with their forefathers. The inscriptions were public and meant to be read by passerbys. This is not graffiti in the sense that we're usually thinking of, right? They're informally composed in, a se well, in the sense that you don't have a mason doing this. Perhaps they're not commissioned in the same way, but they served a real function in their context. Now, I said there were 54 inscriptions associated with Gob. There was a 55th inscription about two kilometers away, another bend in a wadi. We found this text. Now, it's very nice because you have a bilingual Greek Safiyyadik at the bottom. And, but that's not the, that's not, actually, that's the least interesting part of this rock. It's the top inscription here that we want. Liwa'il Ba'al Gob. This man identifies himself simply as her husband, right? by Wa'il, husband of Gub. So whoever she was, it was, people were more likely to recognize you by being her husband than by being the son of your father, right? And that's fascinating. We can, if we have time, we can talk about the, the Greek Safiric bilingual at the end. So, um, this survey of different ways that writing intersects with, um, uh, with memory and with funerary uh, uh, ritual and installations, at the same time tells us a little bit about the way the nomads conceptualized death, what was responsible for death, and, uh, and ways that perhaps you could try to escape it. 
Uh, mene, fate, is very common in a funerary context in the Safiyyadic inscriptions. And we can, we remember this line here uh, from the Quran, وَقَالُوا مَا هِيَ إِلَّا حَيَاتُنَا الدُّنْيَا نَمُوتُ وَنَحْيَا وَمَا يُهْلِكُنَا إِلَّا الدَّهَرِ Right, so dahr, I would say, is basically the equivalent of Safiyadik manai, fate, is the main cause of doom, of death. We have lots of prayers for deliverance from manai and Safiyadik. They usually begin with the phrase, وَالتَّذَرَ manai," and fate lay in wait, stalking the living. Again, images that we get from later Arabic poetry. Fate lays in wait. fallit min bus. Prayer to the deity, deliver from evil, deliver from misfortune. Deliver him. Manai appears always in this phrase, manai, and then in a funerary context, manai wins. Manai ultimately succeeds. وَجَمَعَ عَلَى حَبِيب فَحَبِيب He grieved for loved one after loved one. فَرُّغِمُوا مَنَاي All struck down by fate. وَجَمَعَ عَلَى حَسِينَةَ حَبِيبَتُهُ رَغِيمَةَ مَنَاي His beloved struck down by fate. It's very, and so in a sense you get this feeling that fate is constantly stalking the living, no matter what form fate takes, whether it is disease, drought, whether it is the enemy. All of those things are manifestations of fate. You can make prayers for deliverance, but, when you, but this is the common thing that you find on funerary inscriptions, struck down by fate. It's a beautiful prayer, beautiful Safiyyadic inscription that I published uh, two years ago, I think, we, we rediscovered it in the Harra, that gives you this idea of ultimately the gods can deliver you momentarily from this uncomprehending force, has no mercy. But in the end, fate, there is no, there is no escape from it. So an individual, Masik bin Asad bin Salim, waqa'ada aad warada fadhakara hamauta faqasafa, fahallat ammiri sadiqik, wagannini wa min maut laysa fasai. He remembered the dead, and he grieved, and he makes this prayer to Allah, grant long life to your righteous worshiper. صديقك وجنني protect him ومن موت ليس فصاي but from death there can be no deliverance there is no uh, there is no coming back from that thank you all very much for your attention